vantage on this particular tank design is that the main gun is down here in the hull. You can see there's a conventional anti-tank gun in it, but this is the gun that does the business, and having it low down in the hull is a handicap when we come to talk about the hull down position. In other words, you're using ground to hide the body of the tank and just fighting the gun looking over the ridge. It is quite clear from the height of this tank and the position of this gun that there'll be a lot of tanks sticking up in the air when it's trying to hide behind a ridge and shell an enemy position. So from a pure design point of view, this is not the best place to put a tank's gun. Compare the large and ungainly grant with the sleek form of this late war German tank killer and the advantages soon become apparent. A low silhouette which presented a squat target was difficult to hit and sloping armour deflected shots away from the vehicle. As the war progressed, the same course was ultimately adopted by all sides, which was to combine both an anti-tank capability and an infantry support role in one vehicle by mounting the largest possible high-velocity gun. The larger calibre effectively gave it a good high-explosive firing capability as well as a deadly killing power against other tanks. In the Polish campaign of September 1939, the German generals would have loved to have such excellent tanks. Nonetheless, they were still able to provide a quick and complete victory for Hitler, despite extreme reservations about the suitability of the available tank designs and the limitations of the new tactics. Guderian was prepared to stick his neck out for the tank and the Blitzkrieg against very considerable opposition and it's very important to realize that, you know, the tank wasn't readily adopted. The idea of, of the Blitzkrieg wasn't taken to the bosom of the German high command, quite the contrary. And therefore Guderian really had to push it very hard indeed. And became, of course, in the course of the Second World War, if you like, the, uh, the master of the German tank arm. And saw it through its early trials and into most of its major successes. And its decline as well. Despite the concerns of the generals, Hitler had triumphed in Poland. Now his gambling instincts ran unchecked. Hitler turned his attentions to the invasion of France and his generals grew nervous. They knew that this time there would surely be no repeat of the easy victory won in Poland. Hitler's combination of political brinkmanship and calculated gambles had disguised the fact that the German army at this time could deploy only 2,000 tanks. The British and French could count on 4,500. Not only were their numbers inferior, but many of the tanks deployed by the Germans were of limited fighting value. As we have seen, one of the main offenders in this respect was the tiny Panzer I light tank. Seen here in Bovington, this machine still bears the evidence of the shells fired through the hull which disabled it. The ease with which the thin armour of the Panzer I could be penetrated had been cruelly exposed in Poland, but some 520 machines still had to be engaged for the coming invasion of France. There was simply no alternative. Of far greater military value was the Panzer IV then one of the best tanks in the world. But in 1940, only 200 of these machines were available, which meant that the best and most heavily armoured tank available to the Wehrmacht accounted for less than 10% of the tank force. It was an oversight which could potentially have been disastrous, as throughout its long career, the Panzer IV was to prove a remarkably versatile design. There are those who say that if the Germans had stuck to the Panzer IV and built large numbers of them, they'd done a lot better than messing about with tanks like the Tigers and Panthers. The reason is that this was a superb all-round design. It was in service when the war broke out. It was still an effective frontline tank at the end. And the reason is that the Germans built expandability into the design. Its armour thickness increases two or three times over the wartime period and that does not affect the tank's performance at all, although it's getting heavier. And the gun, although it doesn't increase in calibre, certainly increases in size from a short-barreled 75 to this long 75, 
which enabled it to keep pace with developments on the other side. In other words, we would come up with tanks like the Cromwell and the Sherman. By upgunning the Panzer IV, the Germans kept pace with us and in some ways were that bit ahead of us. And it probably would have suited them better to have large numbers of these things in the field than mess about with the heavy tanks which, for all their other virtues, were a considerable liability on the maintenance front. Taken together with the Mark III and IV, the German tank force on the eve of the decisive battle in France deployed 500 Panzer I's, 1,000 Panzer II's, 350 Panzer III's, 200 Panzer IV's, and 400 of the Czech manufactured Panzer 38 T's. This very high proportion of light tanks would have proved hopelessly inadequate later in the war. But in 1940, evolutionary forces had not yet begun to work, and the light tanks were still capable of doing the job, but only just. But as the history books testify, Hitler was to triumph as completely in France as he had done in Poland. He did so for two reasons. Firstly, there were the poor French and British tank tactics. Although some pioneering work had been done in Britain, it was the Germans who had developed Blitzkrieg to its fullest extent, with the help of their future adversary, the Russians. As the Germans began to be very well aware, it was the Red Army under Tukhachevsky, under Halebsky and others who were de developing the theory of what is called deep battle. In other, in other words, operations for deep penetration using a combination of tank troops and airborne troops and, if you like, um, motorized infantry. So I think it's a little unfair to um, ascribe all of this to Little Hart and to Fuller. It was, in many respects, uh, the practical experience which the Germans acquired in Russia, which I would regard as being perhaps the most decisive and even more important. The Russians at the same time were wor working out very, very complex theoretical backgrounds to this. So there was a co coincidence, if you like, of the German interest and commitment and, and Soviet practice. One other significant factor which led to the German victory in 1940 was that the superior French tanks were distributed in small contingents throughout the army. The German tanks, on the other hand, were concentrated together in the new Panzer divisions, superbly led by able commanders. The combination of efficient battlefield tactics and inspired leadership made the difference for Hitler. But it served to disguise the many weaknesses which existed in the tank designs themselves. By the time these flaws were discovered, mercifully, for the rest of humanity, it would be too late. The German army in 39-40 was not particularly more mechanized than, say, the French army but they made great use of being able to concentrate their forces. Much of the logistics was horse-drawn. They could range far and wide, but whenever they had to move their bases forward, much of their supplies, including the fuel, had to come in by horse. Uh, the result is that uh, the, the pace of their ability to move their operations eastward was much diminished. During 1941, the real weaknesses of the German tank designs were still not discovered. Several false conclusions were drawn from the conquest of the Balkans and Greece. These easy victories supported the continued German belief that their tanks were the best in the world. Although the design work that was to lead to the Tiger had begun, there was little real urgency. Up to the summer of 1941, Germany's main adversary had been Britain, and British tank design lagged behind Germany's. In the North African campaign, the poor performance of the British Crusader tanks only gave fresh support to the German view that the Panzer III and IVs were at least equal to anything the Allies could throw at them. The Crusader was particularly badly designed, and it was plagued by a host of mechanical failures. Eventually, the British Army lost faith in their own tanks altogether, and in 1943, when the victorious British and American forces embarked from Africa for the invasion of Italy, all of the British tanks were left behind. Now, the Crusader is arguably one of the worst tanks Britain ever produced. It was a cruiser tank. That means it was designed to travel fast and relied on its speed far rather than its armour thickness for protection. 
The drawback was it was also chronically unreliable and breakdowns between